The following program is brought to you by the League of Women Voters. enjoyed the refreshments and you'll enjoy some more of them so we don't have to lug them home again. I'm Ann Spire. I've been a league member forever it seems and I have the honor of moderating this morning. This is one of my favorite meetings because it's a very free-flowing discussion of issues. I thank all of the legislators who have made the time to come see us on a Saturday morning. Uh, Representative Terziak is expected. I hope nothing came up and he'll be here too. What our <laughs> format is today is that I would appreciate each of you giving us a little bit of background of what committees you were on, what your hopes are for the session, what your worries are, your concerns, your legislation that you will be particularly working on. Uh, after that, it's pretty much open to the audience. Ask what you want. I will call on people. I would appreciate questions, not speeches. Because we want to really hear the answers from the legislature. Towards. Uh, if we get onto one subject over and over and over and over, I may take some prerogative of saying, time to move on, folks. There's a lot of issues in this state. Let's give a little time to cover a lot of stuff. Afterwards, I'd imagine some of our guests will be able to stick around and have a little chat time as well, informally, if there's more that you want to say to them. So, let's see, my little notes. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization. I'm used to that phrase, but what it means is that we support elections by doing registration and work like that. We support issues, we study issues, and then we take positions on them. We lobby the legislature, the Congress, the local bodies, but we do not ever stand for candidates or parties. That's what that statement means. Uh, this is, as you probably have noticed, being taped. It'll be broadcast on Nutmeg TV. If you're hiding out, try the back of the room. <laughs> and other than that, please turn off anything that chimes cell phones, watches, whatever. If you turn it off, we would appreciate it. So, with no more to be said about that, Rick, you seem to be sitting in front of the microphone, <laughs> and I know you did some sound tests, so why don't you begin, and then if you can pass that one around, among the, can, the can people at the here. dais, I'd love it. Thank you. Okay, we'll bring it down to the end, and off we go. Bobby Sanchez. We'll please. go in order. That's the teacher in me. Anyway, um, <laughs> thank you um, for giving us the opportunity, the League of Women Voters, for give, giving us the opportunity to come here and share um, what we plan on doing this year, um, some things that are on the agenda, and to also get um, ideas and get some questions from the audience, and hopefully we can answer them. If we can't answer them, we'll get back to you with, uh, with the answer. Um, but it's going to be a very busy year, although it's a short session, um, I know I'm getting bombarded already at the, on the education committee for a lot of requests. Um, so um, there are probably going to be a lot of bills that won't be won't go through because of the fact that it's, it is a short session. But we're going to try our best. Um, so I'll pass it on. And my name is um, Bobby Sanchez, 25th District. Oh, I'm on the um, I'm the chair of the education committee. I'm on the finance committee, and I'm also on the higher ed committee. 
Thank you, Representative Sanchez. Good morning, everybody. I'd like to welcome all of you and thank the League of Women Voters. Thank all of you for taking the time out to be here this morning. I'm Gennaro Bizarro. I'm uh, the State Senator for the 6th District. Uh, currently, I sit on the Judiciary Committee, the uh, Education Committee, with uh, along with uh, the co-chair uh, to my left here, uh, Representative Sanchez, and also on the Insurance and Real Estate Committees. Um, I do want to apologize in advance. I may have to depart early, so I, I definitely won't be around afterwards for any uh, question and answers, but if you uh, have anything that you want to talk to me about, I always welcome you to contact me directly. Um, and uh, this year, as Representative Sanchez said, it, it is a short session year. Um, it's a little quirky because the bills are uh, raised as committee bills only, so they're uh, unless they're pertaining to finances. Um, so we're kind of limited in the things that we, as individual legislators, uh, can sponsor um, and uh, and request. Uh, but as always, I'm looking forward to trying to uh, do my best to correct the uh, flaws in the financial system here in the state, uh, try to see what we can do about uh, coming up with a resolution that's fair uh, with, with regard to infrastructure repairs, um, you know, whether that's uh, uh, something, some, one of the alternatives that the Republicans have proposed to tolls, uh, well, you know, that'll remain to be seen, but uh, those are really the priorities this year. Thank you very much. Hello, and thank you all for coming out. Um, State Representative Rick Lopes, I represent the 24th District in New Britain, to the, roughly the southern third of New Britain. I serve on the Finance Committee with Bobby, as well as the um, Energy and Technology Committee and the Transportation Committee. Uh, as Senator Gennaro just said, um, Senator Bizarro, sorry. Um, one of the issues we're going to be facing is the shortfall in transportation funds. I know there's an awful lot of debate, there's a lot of hot topics about how we're going to solve the shortfall of transportation funding, but the one thing we all agree on is there's going to be a shortfall in transportation funding. That's to keep the potholes filled, keep the bridges up, and not even talking about new projects. Just to do the basics, we are short on money, and it becomes a financing issue. I mean, how are we going to pay for it? We have to come up, hopefully collaboratively, with a system that will pay for it and keep our roads and bridges functioning, because if they don't, our economy suffers. So uh, that'll be a challenge this session, and uh, uh, that'll be enough for now. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Senator Henry Martin. I represent the 31st District, which is made up of Plainville, Bristol, Harwinton, Thomaston, and Plymouth. Uh, I serve as ranking member on the Transportation Committee, and I am right in the thick of things regarding the toll issue. I also am the ranking member on the Commerce Committee, and lastly, I also sit on the Bonding Revenue uh, Committee as, as well. Uh, I think tolls is the uh, probably on top of everyone's mind. Uh, one of the uh, issues that I want to continue pursuing uh, and we did some uh, mileage on this last uh, session, uh, but uh, it's going to continue to be on my radar, and that is developing workforce uh, training uh, for the uh, manufacturing sector along with expanding that because we are recognizing that it's not only the manufacturing sector that has workforce, need, workforce needs, but it also includes the medical field, finance world, uh, as long, and uh, trade, the trades as well. Uh, so the uh, developing apprenticeship programs are on the top of my mind. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, Bill Pettit, representative for the 22nd, which is uh, all of Plainville and the west end of uh, New Britain, sort of uh, uh, Finneman's uh, down to uh, down Slater, almost down to the end. Uh, I am the ranking member on public health. I'm on with Representative Lopes on uh, energy and technology and uh, appropriations. Um, the big issues certainly uh, from public health are going to be the uh, vaccine issue and the religious uh, exemption. Uh, the second big one, which I think will have more uh, collaboration and support, will be issues concerning uh, vaping, which our working group met on a, a, a week ago. So I think there's going to be a, a number of bills concerning the vaping epidemic in our schools. Uh, Thirdly, we're continuing to work on the uh, opioid issue. We can have an opioid working group as opposed to there being multiple 
bills the last couple of years, our, our chairperson, uh, Representative Steinberg, we've decided to go forward with omnibus bills that may have four or five sections to them, and we're going to probably do the same thing this year with opioids and have one uh, large bill to try to tackle a number of the issues still outstanding that uh, impact the opioid uh, issues since we again had, I think, 1,088 overdose deaths in uh, Connecticut uh, last year. We thought we had peaked and were on the way down, and actually was a, a, probably a smidgen higher than the year before. Thank you. Thank you for your opening comments. It helps to know what committees you focus on, and we will probably be up at Hartford at some point talking to you. Let me open up the questions with something that the League has asked that we talk about, the State League, and that's on campaign finance uh, funding. And their question that they've asked us to share with you, because this is something very dear to the League to open up the election process, is, is what is your personal experience with the public financing of elections through the CEP, the Citizens Election Program? How would you improve? How would you support the CEP? Or, I will add, are you interested in cutting it back to save funds? Uh, I've used it the last two elections. It's worked reasonably well. The one thing I do right off the bat is there's, there's a minimum contribution of uh, $5. I'd make it. I'd make it a dollar. Um, it just always sort of feels funny to me to say, "Hey, Mr. Smith, Mrs. Jones, you need to give me five bucks <laughs> to sign this so I can run for office." Um, I could see the the token dollar, but I, I certainly had the experience at a number of places of, of people not not having the five bucks and feeling bad that they couldn't sign the pe the petition. Uh, I think, I think it does level the playing field. Certainly there's been, been moves to uh, get rid of it. And I guess one of the issues we face is that they, they don't have really enough people in the office to, to enforce and do, do what they, they need to do, though I think for the, for the most part, uh, and I think my colleagues would, would echo it, I think most people really play, play by the rules and we've seen very little, uh, very little funny business, if you will, with the, with the election uh, funds. I also have used the uh, CEP for the, my three times, uh, three terms that I've run. I think it definitely does level the playing field when uh, it's used in that way. And what I mean by that is uh, the last election, uh, there are some in the Senate who decided not to use the CEP money, and they used their own money to the tune of three, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000. And just to give you an idea, so as a state senator, or you're running for state senate, we have to have 300 signatures from our district, and those are from, um, you know, and we can raise money, uh, we need to raise $15,000 in order to qualify for $95,000. So you add the two together, you have a, a total of $110,000, give or take $1,000. So. Uh, when you use that and everybody's on the same playing field, so we, it's pretty, it works quite well. When it doesn't work well is when you have those that uh, decide not to use it and then they raise more and use their own private money and now that there's an imbalance and we currently experience a couple senators uh, who put in $400,000 of their own money into their campaigns and they won. So, you know, that's a, this, uh, everything that we work for to make the playing field equal just vanished because of that. So I think that needs to be addressed. Uh, and regarding uh, getting rid of it, yeah, maybe we can reduce the amount. I think for myself, I run every two years and I have to raise 15,000 to get 95. And it's just, a, it's not that it's a lot of work. It is work, but you know, but we've got to do this every two years and we're using state money, $95,000. You know, it's just, a, for me, an obscene a lot of money. Thank you. Um, overall, well, first of all, I, I, I would be remiss not to mention that uh, for those of you who like the system, which seems to be very successful with over 80% of legislators using it, and the ones who don't use it generally don't have tough races, they, they elect not to use it. So it, overall, unanimously, Pretty much everyone in a race uses it, and uh, the the architect of the 
the system is sitting in the room, and I think he deserves a round of applause, yeah. former Senator DeFranzo, who actually developed and passed the bill. And at the time, it was uh, groundbreaking. It's, uh, we were national leaders in getting corruption and dirty money out of politics. I mean, we were truly the state leading the way. If some of you remember, most of you was a, a little older, so you, you remember we were called Corrupticut for, for a short while. There were serious problems. This bill singularly, did all by itself, eliminated the vast majority of corruption in politics, special interest money, and it's, nothing's perfect, but it was the best bill passed in the state, in the country at the time, and it still is incredibly effective. And over the years, there have been slight tweaks to it who, that I've object, objected to that have made it not quite as good as it used to be, but there's a lot of reasons uh, for why they happen. Um, but still overall, great program, does tremendous amounts of goodwill for politicians in general to let people know that we're not getting funded by one or two uh, special interest kind of people and that we are beholden more to the public than we are to special interests. Uh, addressing uh, Senator Martin, not Representative Martin like the tag says, <laughs> Senator Martin here, um, his issue about certain people who have the wealth to overspend, that is something that was in the bill that, uh, to, there was something in that bill to address it. The, that was eliminated. The reason that was eliminated was a legal issue. It was deemed unconstitutional by the courts. And uh, so that provision that would balance out a person who can self-fund at a high level was, uh, was a legal problem and is no longer in the bill. So there's something that still exists. And there's really no way to address it that we can think of without causing other constitutional problems. But that is, my experience with it is it's, it's a very wonderful system that makes the campaign about talking to voters and talking about policy, not about raising money. So two things, um, as a threshold philosophical uh, matter, I firmly support clean election funding. I think that's incredibly important, and as uh, Representative Lopes uh, just indicated, it, you know, I think we should be incredibly proud um, that Connecticut has been at the forefront of that in, uh, with respect to this matter. Um, I also do think, uh, unfortunately, the cost of elections in general, um, from local level elections all the way up, has just gotten uh, out of control. I mean, it's obscene, the amount of money that gets spent. It, it really is. It's such a waste. Um, and I would love to figure out a way to put those dollars to better use to help serve our community uh, instead of just getting recycled around the, uh, the political arena. Um, I, I would make a couple of um, alterations uh, right out of the gate. I, uh, Representative Pettit stole my thunder. I've always believed that they, there was a, uh, a disconnect here. I know that the, the legislation attempts to bifurcate the fundraising part of it with, um, from the uh, community support. Um, and so you have a $5 minimum threshold, and then you also have to reach a certain number of um, constituents or, or people in your district. I would eliminate uh, the $5 requirement in its entirety. It never made sense to me at all. I would just simply say that you have to have um, X number of people in your district who are willing to sign a petition for you uh, and not have to commit any dollars to it and then have the uh, funding come from any other sources and you can put a cap on it. Um, because as Representative Pettit said, it, it's kind of awkward when you ask people, hey, you know, do you want to uh, you want to support me? Can you sign this? But I need five bucks from you. So that never makes sense to me. Um, and one other thing, too, that uh, I've seen in recent years that I think is a problem that ought to be addressed is when legislators participate in the, in the funding and take the money, the grant from the state, and then don't even get sworn in. I think that's a problem. Um, I know that people don't do it uh, intentionally, uh, but I think we've got to figure out a better way of, of uh, making the state whole in those situations. Thank you. Um, I support it. I've had a couple of issues with it in the past. Um, one being that I get audited all the time. <laughs> and I pass the audit, but why is it that I get audited all the time? So I, I have questions there. And when I ask other legislators if they get audited every year, they say no. <laughs> so, so I have questions there. Um, and some of the answers I get is that SEEK is, um, you know, has less employees, but I still question why, you know, their system. But um, that being said, 
I also have an issue with the $5 requirement because um, I have a very poor district, the poorest district in the city of New Britain, and probably the fifth poorest district in the state of Connecticut. And so for me to go door knocking and ask some of my constituents for five bucks, very hard, very hard to do. Um, so I, that was, that's probably one of the requirements that I would agree with uh, Senator uh, Bizarro um, to eliminate that $5 requirement. And, and people can get whatever they can get. If they can get 50 cents, then get 50 cents. Sign the petition and that's what we, that's what we really need, those numbers. Um, and then we'll try to get the dollars somewhere else. And that, so I agree with that. Um, but I do agree that it's um, the you know the corruption is out of the system because people can't give you thousands and thousands of dollars um, to basically buy your vote in the House or in the Senate because that's what happens. Corruption is horrible um, in the United States. Um, I recently went to a, um, a national Hispanic conference in Dallas, Texas, and we talked a little bit about. Um, you know, um, elections and how they are funded. And you can see the differences between uh, uh, different states where people can get up to $5,000 contribution from one particular individual. And that says a lot when you, when you have somebody that can only give you $5 and someone that can give you $5,000. Um, so um, we, we need something nationally. Um, but Connecticut has a good system, but I would tweak it um, just to make it a little more fair. Hey, thank you. It's good to see the bipartisan support among you. All right, I will open this up to the room. Let me first say, please use the microphone when it's given to you, because otherwise the tape can't pick you up. So our little text comment here, please use the microphone no matter how loudly you can speak. Thank you. Uh, last year, the legislature passed a bill to create a uh, commission to study the after effects of incarceration. Uh, many people serve their time in prison, serve their parole, come out, find that, for many, that uh, they are effectively prevented from getting a job, and some of them are pushed back into crime because they have no way to lawfully reintegrate into society. Uh, the commission's report is due this year and will undoubtedly be coming before the legislature this year. What are each of your views on that topic? Well, I, I think the person that can answer most of this is right next to me right here. He's on the Judiciary Committee. But um, my topic, working with dads for like the last 19 years, because I, I, I did a side job of um, fatherhood initiative, and um, many of the fathers that come into the group, not all, but many um, were at one point incarcerated or just coming out of incarceration. And the difficulty of them to get housing and to get a job is just unbelievable. Um, and then you have individuals that have a clean record for five or 10 years and they still struggle to get jobs and still struggle to get housing. Um, so the system is not fair at all. So I'm hoping that we can find ways to help these individuals because we don't want them to go back into the system. Um, and that happens to some of them because they get so frustrated, um, they go back to what they got in trouble in the first place. Um, and so we don't want that to happen. And then we've had, I can tell you stories of some very productive individuals who um, still have a record but were able to find a job, were able to get housing, and are living wonderful lives today and clean records. So this is what we want to do in the state of Connecticut, um, to help these individuals as much as possible. So, um, and the, the fact that also the family court system makes it hard for these individuals as well, because I've been to family court many times with some of these fathers. And because they have that felony, the court system also frowns on them in regards to reuniting them with their children. And, and that's wrong. So, um, I'm hoping that I'm hoping that this um, study comes back with some positive um, ways to, to change the system, and um, and we'll see where um, where it goes from there. Thank you. Um, great question. It's uh, it's tough to answer on a specific level. 
uh, obviously without seeing any specific proposals that are coming out um, by the uh, by the committee um, you know one of the things that we do um, on the Judiciary Committee is we have to take a look at how uh, the laws that we want to pass might impact other areas um, other areas of the law that are not specific to that particular legislation so um, you know it's kind of hard to without fleshing out the language to know exactly um, you know what we're talking about I will say in general on, on a general level um, we a we have done a lot in recent years to address the issue of uh, recidivism and um, I think you know from housing um, to employment um, to community uh, based legislation uh, community efforts there has been a lot of things that Connecticut has done at the um, at the uh, legislative level to address that issue um, and we've made tremendous strides um, I will also say that all things are related nothing exists in a vacuum so when we're talking about things like helping um, convicted felons or people who are incarcerated uh, come out and be reintegrated the we have to look past just the issue of what we need to do specifically for that individual we have to look at how the employment for instance how the uh, employment market looks we have to look at um, what sort of um, workforce development uh, initiatives are out there these are all things that come into play so it's sort of a, we have to have a global perspective on this and not just something that's specific. And so I think that gets lost in the shuffle a lot of times. So when we talk about things like, you know, what we can do to improve the manufacturing areas and improve infrastructure in the state, uh, all of these things, and, and to reduce the, the burdens that um, uh, taxpayers have in the state, all of those things contribute to helping uh, with things like recidivism and integration of, uh, of incarcerated individuals into our society. I haven't worked so much in any of the committees that address this issue directly, but so I'll speak a little bit more globally. The bottom line issue of our criminal justice system is that as a society, we failed another segment of our, our community. It's supposed to be Feedback. Ah. <laughs> Handyman. It's it's uh, it's supposed it. All right, we're good. And we're good. Okay. All right. Um, we're we're supposed to have a system of crime and rehabilitation, and as everyone knows, what we really have is a system of crime and punishment. And crime and punishment doesn't work. People go to jail, they serve their punishment, and then when it's over, they're sent out into the community without skills, uh, without a re legitimate rehabilitation, and also with almost a scarlet letter of, uh, you're, you're a criminal now, you really can't work anymore. You really can't, you're, you're a, a sub-member of society. And if we really want to make longer changes, despite all the other stuff we're talking about, uh, workforce initiatives, housing initiatives, we really have to get a different mindset of people who do a crime and are found guilty need to be rehabilitated so they're not in a revolving door of just simply going back to jail, back to jail, back to jail. And that means things like when they're in jail, they need to be treated as people who need help, not people who are being punished. And yes, yeah, some people do absolutely terrible things. There, there's a sub, se separate subset. The vast majority of criminal activities, let's go back to the, the time when people were going to jail for selling marijuana. You know, something's, going to jail for something so small and simple that may even be legalized or is legalized in many other states is kind of ridiculous. These people need to be re rehabilitated, brought out in the back of the community, and found, uh, have ways to live a, a life that's a constructive citizen, not fall back into their ways that leads them back to jail and have more punishment. So on a more global side is if we have more of a mindset of like crime and rehabilitation as opposed to crime and punishment, I think we could do better as a society as a whole. And, and go from there. Thanks. Thank you. So my take on this is that uh, my, or my concern, I guess, is the, the, uh, those that are felons, those that cannot be or do not want to be rehabilitated, 
making sure that they stay incarcerated, um, pay their penalty, versus allowing, I guess, and this happened in my in, in Bristol where uh, a convicted felon was released early because of credits earned, got released higher than the kite, and stabbed and killed a baby. So I'm all for uh, helping those that want to help themselves, those that are, uh, who have, uh, are remorseful, I'll say, and do want to be uh, good citizens once they get out, helping them get jobs, housing. I am looking forward to this report because I think that'll guide us into the right direction. But I think we need to be cognizant of the fact that there are those that cannot be and don't, do not want to be re rehabilitated, making sure that they stay where they belong so that the rest of us are protected from them. Uh, so I, I am looking forward to, to this report. I guess I guess I'd agree with Senator Bizarro. It's tough to make a specific comment because when it comes down to discussion, it's going to come down to the specific crimes, misdemeanors. It's certainly going to have to involve uh, nonviolent crimes. The governor's going to put forward a proposal to wipe clean the slate. Apparently, five, when people are out for out for five years, and the devil's going to be in the details. So it depends on which uh, crimes are continued. And I think uh, Bobby uh, or Senator Sanchez mentioned the family court issue, and that's going to be a, a sticky net in terms of the details. The only other part I'll throw in that I think is globally related, since that term has been thrown around three or four times, is that I've been up there three years, and the vast majority, the overwhelming majority of bills that come forward out of judiciary are about the criminal justice system and the criminals, and there's very little attention to victims. Um, so we have a reasonable victim's we have a better victims uh, services <clears throat> uh, approach here in the state of Connecticut and in other states, but I think the Office of the Victim Advocate and the Office of Victim Services are still underfunded and still uh, under undermanned. So the thing that's impressed me in three years in terms of criminal issues is that we, we pay very, very, very little attention to, to victims, and I think that strikes a lot of people as uh, unfair in the, in the and maybe not directly related to this, because I like to see people out and be able to be employed and, and have their own housing and, and, and do that, that type of thing. But I think, again, when you're, you're bal balancing things, we also need to make sure that we're paying attention to the victims. And we have another question. Are you? Okay, we'll get back to you. Hi, uh, my name is Mary Writings Ward, and I would like to go back to uh, the question on the Citizens Election Program, uh, CEP, we often call it the Clean Elections Program, but I really like the name Citizens Election Program because the intent was founded upon the citizens participating. And I heard several comments um, that I would like some further clarification on. Uh, some of the comments uh, seem to be a little bit partisan about particular instances where legislators got elected and then took a different job. I don't think that's the flavor of what this program is about. I think this program is about the citizens having influence and money is influence. And so I do not want the money to come from other sources. I want it to either come from the citizenry or to come from our government. I think a true clean election program would be one where the government pays for the elections. So I would like your comments on that, please. Why don't we start with Representative Martin? Not to always start on the very end. State Senator. 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 Okay, then I apologize. Mary, thank you. That's fine. That's fine. Uh, Mary, thank you for your question. Uh, I like the CEP grant uh, money, uh, or the program, I should say. I, I think, you know, when I first ran my very first term, it's great that for a newbie, right, to be able to have a level playing field against an incumbent. Uh, it happened to be an open seat at that time. 
but I, I think if we had equal amount of money for all candidates, it's it's uh, we have to use our money in a smart way in order to get elected. What better way of getting this uh, uh, of running of running for office than making sure there's a level playing field across the board? Mary, I think you nailed the, the issue, the crux of why this program is so good right on the head. It is the involvement of the citizens. The forcing a candidate who's interested in office to go out to voters and say, listen, I'm running for this seat. Will you support me? Will you show that support with a $5 donation? Is really good because there becomes a time and you know, with the long incumbencies like we have in our system now, if you've been in office for a very long time, you, there's a habit of talking to less and less people every time you're, you're up there. And this, this program actively forces candidates to go back out to the community and meet people, talk to people, interact with people, and that's when people are more than willing to support you with their $5 donation, is when they know you and they've interacted with you and they feel comfortable with you. So that's why the program has been so successful. <laughs> Again, I'm going to stand by my comments earlier. I mean, I think, um, you know, you, you're right, I agree with you in that uh, it's very important that we have uh, clean elections. Um, and that we do whatever we can to eliminate any uh, sort of um, any influence and, and corruption from the system. Um, but I, I'm sorry, I just I'm going to disagree with my colleague. Uh, I, I just I don't think that it's appropriate to have to ask people to support you and give you um, a monetary donation at the same time. You know, as Representative Sanchez pointed out, I mean, people in this district struggle, and, and it's you know I, I just I think it's a fundamentally unfair to ask them to articulate their support for you in the form of contributing $5. I just I think that that actually runs counter to what the points that you just made um, and does more to, um, uh, you know, to isolate uh, people and to, to, I think it diminishes from the whole point of the Citizens Election Program in the first place. Um, so I, I would eliminate that requirement, um, but, you know, beyond that, I think the program is, is good in theory. I, um, I, I do think that unfortunately elections just cost way too much money. I think the cost has, has just skyrocketed and it's obscene. Uh, I'm saddened by it. I wish there were better ways. I mean, I, I understand your point about wanting to compel a level playing field and mandate that. Well, I mean, the problem is the more it comes from the, the government, the less there is to share for other programs. So when people say, well, we need this, and we need more money for education, and we need money to fix the roads. Well, you know, the more money we give to candidates to run elections and to hire um, the same companies who are going to print the same uh, pamphlets over and over again, the less money we have to redistribute to our communities. I'd rather see that money go into education. I'd rather see it going into uh, programs like the Care for Kids or something like that. I mean, there's a million programs I can give you. Um, so, you know, I, I stand by my comments earlier. I think we've got to figure out ways to bring the cost down. I do think, uh, unfortunately, when you have candidates who uh, are not participating, and that, that doesn't apply to any of us here, but you know, Senator Martin uh, brought up, there are instances in the Senate where uh, I think it's actually, I think people spent more than $400,000 on a Senate seat. I mean, that's outrageous. You know, spending four to $700,000 on a state Senate seat here in Connecticut that just can't be the future, ladies and gentlemen. We can't be heading down that, that road. I mean, it's, you know, what are we going to do as a state to mandate a level playing field? Are we going to start distributing $500,000 to each of us that wants to run a campaign? That's crazy. So that's pretty much it. Thank Can you. I interrupt for a second? Would it be fair, since we already spent time on this issue, to leave both Representative Pettit and Representative Sanchez out of a second statement on this and move on to another question? You good with that? Okay, let's have another question then. Uh, good morning. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I mean, I had some more juice this morning. But uh, good morning, thank you guys. Um, um, for those that already know me, thank you guys for coming out this early in the morning. Um, my name is Pablo Rodriguez. I'm the uh, president of the North Oak NRZ. Believe it or not, this is a 
Sir, dear, that uh, the North Oak NRG, uh, along with uh, Representative Sanchez here, we represented one of the poorest districts in the city of New Britain. I have a three-part question. Um, the first question um, I would like to address to uh, Representative Pettit and Senator Bizarro. Um, you know, you know, we have a serious, serious sexual f uh, offender, uh, non-compliant issues within our our ward and the third ward and the city. We have over 41 non-registered, non-compliant sex offenders, and some of you guys have been the victims of sexual assault and sexual um, deviance. What is being done at the state level? Because when I talk to the chief of police and the aldermen and the city and they address it to the chief of police, um, his push is that it is a state police problem. It's a state issue. It's a state, um, it's a state matter, not a city matter to warrant that. The second question I have that uh, for Pevet is that, you know, you're on the public health committee. We have an issue with... Uh, contaminated properties and contaminated property within residents um, that live to that proximity, which still are being contaminated for over 14 years. I've addressed that to uh, Representative Sanchez and some of the aldermen regarding this contamination, and there's always been a push that there hasn't been enough brownfield money to clean up these contaminated property that we inherited in the North Oak NRG. Two properties and to them in public issue with public safety would be one on the corner of Willow and, and North and the one on that been there across the street from an organic farm which is a La Salle and Oak. And that's been a, a very well known contaminated property for a long time that is also uh, adjacent to residents uh, in the area. And the third and last question um, that we have, and I would like to get um, some feedback from Mr. Bizarro, is that we being one of the poorest in the third ward uh, with the residents there and the issue of minimum wage, it would be interesting to find out from Mr. Bizarro why he voted against the minimum wage uh, for one of the poorest city and one of the poorest ward that he's supposed to represent. Thank you. And if others of you want to chime in, please do so. So, um, okay, so let's go back to the first question with respect to the registry. My understanding is that when um, you are convicted of a, a sex offense that mandates uh, registry, the court um, imposes that. And um, I'm not aware, it's the first time I've heard that there's an issue with uh, non-compliance. I would, I would imagine if you're, um, if you get a, well, you're making that face, but I'm just telling you, this is the first time I've heard of yeah, it. Go online, public information. I, I'm not, I'm not, sir, I'm not disputing it. I'm just, I'm just saying this is the first that I've heard of it. So, um, you know, that's something that certainly we could take a look at um, and figure out if there, if there is noncompliance, why that is. Um, uh, I'm not quite sure, to be honest with you. With respect to the minimum wage question, um, you know, I've, uh, I'm on record as saying that I did not, uh, I oppose that. Uh, for a few different reasons. One is, you know, the minimum wage is a minimum wage. It's not, I understand that it's difficult to live in this state on 10 or $11 an hour. Guess what? It's impossible to live on $15 an hour if that's your primary source of income. I mean, that's, you know, um, there's no debate about that. Um, but, you know, we've got to be careful in that, uh, the, of unintended consequences. So, when you're raising the minimum wage, you have to look at the effect that that has on communities like New Britain. You know, you're talking about it from a perspective of a, an employee who wants, uh, who needs more money to survive. Um, but what happens when an employer, like all of those small businesses up and down, um, you know, in uh, in your neighborhood or on Broad Street or in Main Street, New Britain, don't have the money to hire? another employee because they're paying $15 an hour. I mean, if there's no jobs, that $15 an hour minimum wage is completely irrelevant to the person who is looking for that job. Um, so, you know, I, I think that that's the issue and that's, why, um, and that's why I was opposed to it. I mean, in New Britain alone, the uh, Parks and Rec Department is going to incur an additional three, four, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000 it to its budget because of the minimum wage increases. So if we assume that the staffing level remains the same, okay, which is a big if, and I, I don't know how that can happen, but if we do, that means the taxpayers in New Britain are going to have to absorb another $500,000 worth of costs in terms of a mill rate increase. 
So those are the things that we have to look at. Um, you know, and, and then the other thing too is, going back to the employers, maybe, maybe they're not going to lay somebody off or maybe they're not going to refrain from hiring somebody because the minimum wage goes up to $15 an hour. But what about the mid-level employee who's earning significantly more because they're a management level? And they might have gotten a promotion or a significant raise. As an employer, if you all of a sudden have your costs skyrocket on a staffing side, and you can't push those costs through to your consumers and your customers, then the people that are gonna suffer, assuming again, assuming that the staffing levels stay the same, are the mid-level employees who do rely on that wage to support their families, who do have children at home that have to be fed, mortgages to pay, taxes to pay. So for those people who are making 40, 50, 60,000 dollars a year, to not be able to have a salary increase that's significant because their employer now has increased costs, well guess what? That has a big impact, not just on that family, but on the entire community. So those are the reasons why I opposed the minimum wage increase this past year. There are an awful lot of excuses for why not to support the minimum wage bill that we did. And that's what they are. They are excuses. They may cause a problem for employers. They may cause a problem for mid-level employees. They may cause less housing. But we're back to the reality. The reality is it is not a difficult to raise a family and live on $10, $11 an hour. It is impossible. Absolutely impossible. It creates a level of poverty-stricken people who cannot work their way up and live the American dream. The reality is, yeah, $15 an hour still isn't enough, but it's still way better than $11 an hour. And you can start working your way up and out and be productive members of the society. The fact that we pay less than $15 an hour out of the city of New Britain somewhere is reprehensible. The fact that people keep saying things like these entry-level jobs are just kids doing you know, parks and rec kind of stuff. No, they're not. The majority of them are statistically proven to be family people, people in their 30s, people in their 40s trying to raise a family on $10 an hour and less. And that is wrong. It is impossible. It is not right as a society that we have wages that people cannot live on. And so you want to get rid of uh, social programs and assistance and heating assistance and all that stuff. They're in existence because people are not getting paid enough. And they don't have benefits and they don't have health care. And these are the people we represent in this city. Quite a lot of them. It is our duty as the representatives in New Britain to make sure we support things like, like $15 an hour, health care, paid family leave, and things that help people who are facing the toughest economic situations. So I'm a proud supporter, initiator of the minimum wage bill. I think it was one of the greatest successes we've had in a long time, and I hope we can continue on it. When I spoke with uh, my contacts at the uh, Department of Corrections and Pardons and Paroles last, uh, end of last summer or early fall about the issue of uh, this, the sex registry, there's, there's a couple of issues. Uh, people move. <coughs> Some of the offenders move frequently and obviously don't re-register. And manpower, uh, state police is way down in terms of manpower. So it's tough to be able to go out and, and chase down people in the community when you're when you're short on manpower across the state. So I think, to your point, I think part of that's a manpower issue. Part of it is also probably your stratification issue. You may have seen in the paper recently that a bill that's going to come forward based on a working group on sexual offenders in the sexual registry, sexual offenders registry, is to try to risk stratify the registry from the highest risk to the lowest risk that a lot of people believe that based on statute uh, that some people end up on there and have minimal to no chance of ever offending again and it puts them in the same pool as people who are very likely to offend. So there may be some work this session in terms of risk stratifying the, the uh, sex offender registry. I think the other issue is, is a manpower 
issue. And I, and I think you're right, we need, we need to know where those people are. But I think it would be more important to be able to risk stratify. Uh, brownfields, um, I think the state has done a reasonable job. And, and I think there's still a fair amount in, in New Britain. I think it's important to be in contact with your local uh, alderman and, and the mayor's office. There's developers that will develop uh, a property that has brownfields. I think we have funds available and programs available right across the border in Plainville. There's a company called Clean Earth. And the crazy as it sounds, what Clean Earth does is they burn dirt. They, they take dirt from these areas and they work hand in hand with DEP so that contaminated soils can be brought over there and they're burned at very, very high temperatures to move all the volatile hydrocarbons and they, they can't remove everything so certain, uh, certain contaminated soils need to be removed and, and, and stored safely but a lot of them can be rehabilitated and turned into this fine sort of granular dust. It ends up not being dirt at the end because there's no biomass in it. You can't use it for topsoil. You basically can only use it for the, uh, I'm not a construction guy, the stuff, Phil, the stuff you put under your driveways and stuff to pack things down because you can't really grow, grow things in it. So I think there's good brownfield programs, so I think it's important probably to reach out to the alderman in the mayor's office if there's a developer that wants to develop some of the, the, the properties there. The public health looks at it from the point of view of uh, do the regulations make sense in terms of protecting the public health, and most of it comes from other committees in terms of economic development, commerce, and, and the like. Let's move on. I have a question. Hi, Eric Lundin is Peggy Lampin, and we're the voters and the NAACP. I've been driving the corridor of, of can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, I've been driving the corridor from 91 to 95, going to Washington, D.C., for the past 35, 40 years, because I was working there. Um, I don't understand, don't kill the messenger, I don't understand why you are against tolls in the state. And I'll tell you why. I'm for tolls in the state. Now, I'm not talking about going from New Britain to Plainville, New Britain to Bristol, New Britain to Meriden. I'm talking about that highway. I've been, as long as I've been traveling to Washington, D.C., I started off with $6 crossing GW Bridge. Do you know what it costs now to go to cross the GW Bridge? $19 to $20. Go go getting into New Jersey. I started off with $5. You know what it costs now to go through Jersey and Maryland and Delaware? I mean, come on. Why can't we have at least a main highway? Why should people be able to drive in the state of Connecticut for free? Why? That's what I don't understand. Don't shoot the messenger. Just explain to me why you don't want tolls in the state of Connecticut, at least based on that highway. Thank you. I'll, I'll start yeah, to be, be short and then hand it over to the more experienced people. Uh, I'm not intrinsically against tolls. I, like you, have my easy pass and have paid them in the past week in Massachusetts and in New York. I think at the moment we do have the adequate money if we take the gas tax, we take the gross, uh, gross receipts tax, and we take the bipartisan agreed upon uh, in the last budget, the bipartisan uh, budget, the new part of the new car sales tax, I think we have enough to do the projects we need to do. So I'd like to see us do it with the money that we currently have without increasing cost to our citizens. If we go two, three, four years and find out that we don't, then I, then I think we, we seriously need to look at it. But I think right now there's been diversion of these funds from the Special Transportation Fund. You all thought that you voted for a lockbox. The problem is it's a house with the back door <coughs> locked the front door is wide open and, and by that saying once the money's in there deposited in there it takes a super majority vote to get it out for reasons other than transportation but right now money that's intended to go to transportation uses can be diverted before it gets there and i think that's part of the problem okay. Bobby, when you take down the second, you didn't get a chance before flip it on well yeah there it is um i'm not totally against um tolls my issue is that um, one of the things that I've been arguing up, up there for the longest is the, the car tax that we have to pay on a yearly basis. It, it, it's always been something so ridiculous to me um, where you pay 6.35% when you purchase the car and then every year after that your car depreciates but yet you're still paying this property tax to your cities and to your towns. It, it just makes no sense to me. I mean, if, if you look at the Kia that I drive, it's a Kia, not a Cadillac. Um, you know, I factor in what I've paid in taxes on that car. Well, 
guess what? I could probably buy another Kia, brand new Kia. So um, I think that if we want to do tolls, and this is something that I brought up to a number of people, you know, I'm for tolls if we can get rid of the car tax. And let's do tolls, okay, where we get enough revenue to then compensate some of these towns and cities that need that revenue for um, what will be taken away because that, they're the ones that receive that, that money for the property tax. Um, and I'm sure that someone who's paying $1,000 a year on their car tax wouldn't mind paying $300 on, in tolls a year because if that $1,000 is gone, guess what? Do the math. You've got $700 to play with, right? So that's the way I look at it. Um, but um, it's, not, it's very complicated. It's a very complicated issue. And, um, but we, but I, I agree, there's, there's like 40 to 42% of the traffic that comes in through the state of Connecticut are outsiders. And they, our roads you know, get ruined by those big trucks that come through here. And they don't pay a dime. So you know, uh, we have to come up with some plan. And, uh, and just quickly, in regards to borrowing the money, if, if we have to bond the money, if the state has to bond the money, I, I, I don't know if I can support that. The, the, re the reason I can't support that is because we also bond and borrow money for school construction, and I don't know how that would affect the school construction budget moving forward if we bond these dollars. Um, so they are, that, it's really tricky. And so I just wanna make sure and guaranteed that it doesn't affect the school construction dollars if we're gonna go that route because there are many schools out there that need rehabilitation. Um, schools with mold, schools with falling ceilings and, and, and tiles coming up from the floor. So we, we still need to help these towns and cities with um, school construction dollars. And so I, I, I got a feeling that if we go that road where we borrow all the money, it might affect the school construction budget. And I, I, I wouldn't want to see that. Thank you. So I think Representative Sanchez just gave you the answer uh, why many legislators, including myself, are opposed to tolls. You want to know why I'm opposed to tolls? Because we Connecticut residents are overtaxed as it is. It's enough already. Okay? Enough is enough. So Representative Sanchez brought up one example, the car tax. Yeah, I would love to eliminate the car tax. See, again, everything is related. We can't look at things in a vacuum. In a vacuum, the idea of tolls might sound... Um, you know, reasonable, you know, why uh, it's, a, it's a way to, to raise revenue if we need it. But you've got to consider the taxes that we already pay. So no, with all due respect, I have yet to hear a good reason why we need tolls in the state. Why? The, the, to say, well, every other state does it. And when I drive through New York and I drive to Washington, I have to pay an outrageous amount of money yeah, I agree. You, it is crazy that we're paying that much money whenever I go over to GW. Um, but that's not a good answer for me. You know, say, well, everyone else does it. Well, you know, I don't want to be everybody else. I don't want to tax our residents more than they already are just because everybody else does it. So I need to hear a good reason why we need tolls. And, if, and, and I have yet to have anybody, and I, and I would welcome anyone to reach out to me, really, honestly, let me know. I would like to hear why you think we need tolls in the state. Because I've only heard two things so far from all of my constituents who support tolls. And there aren't many, by the way. And, and I applaud you for uh, you know, coming out and telling us that you are a supporter here. But if you have a, a reason why you think we need tolls other than just because you paid in other states, you know, let me know. But I've heard two things. I've heard, uh, one, we need it because we have to make infrastructure repairs. And you know, I think we're... When you say that, you're conflating two different arguments, okay? A Connecticut that exists without tolls and a Connecticut that has solid, sound infrastructure, you know, uh, those are not two mutually exclusive ideas. They can coexist. Why? Because we have the money. You know, as, as, as Representative Pettit said, we have the money to make the needed repairs. It's just a question of prioritizing the allocation of it. So there are some of us who think that it can get done without tolls. And if that's the case, then, okay, then, that, then that's the rebuttal to um, why we should have tolls uh, in this state to fund infrastructure. So then I need to hear another reason why we should have tolls. And if it's because, well, you've got drivers from out of state coming through, putting wear and tear on our roads and not paying for it, 
what I say to that is a couple things. One is I don't want, I'm not interested in paying an additional 80, 85 cents a mile just because I want to try to capture 15 cents from somebody driving through Connecticut. That doesn't interest me at all. And I'm making up those numbers, 85 cents, 15 cents. But the idea, you get the point. You know, we want to try to figure out ways to, you know, have people pay their share. Well, that's fine. But then don't ask me to come out of pocket and pay even more. I'm already paying enough in Connecticut. All of us are. Um, so, I, you know, that idea doesn't work for me at all. Um, it really doesn't. So, um, you know, I'm going to continue to be opposed to tolls until somebody tells me why we need them here in the state. Um, and then, you know, now the, the, the latest proposal is to, to toll trucks only. Um, I'm glad to see that at least what I've heard is that it's going to be revised. One of my concerns with that was, are we taxing, are we going to toll all the trucks? You know, the oil delivery trucks, the small businesses and medium-sized businesses in my district that use trucks. Uh, to travel through and uh, provide their services and their goods to consumers. Um, so that was one of the concerns I had. And, you know, honestly, if in fact we are trying to make the trucking industry pay more because we don't believe that they're paying enough, and, and you may or may not agree that they're paying enough, but let's presuppose for a second that you do uh, think that they should pay more. Well, I got news for you. There's already a mechanism in place for doing that. It's called IFTA, okay? It's an international fuel tax agreement. And what the, these big companies do that have trucks that drive through states is the truckers log all their miles and their gas tax receipts are uh, accounted for. And there's a, there's a uh, formula and they pay pro rata to the states, okay? Based on their, the mileage that, yeah, the mileage and the, and the, uh, that they log through the state. Now, I know, I get, I understand that it's, I think, I forgot what the number is, uh, but whatever the number is, I understand that, was it 12, 30 million dollars? And you may say, well, that's not enough, 30 million dollars. Fine. That goes back to my point. Okay, so where the philosophical debate is, are they paying enough? And if they're not, then we can do things like maybe use IFTA or use something comparable to make them pay more. And it won't involve having a bond for toll gantries. It won't involve putting up tolls and w that might potentially be used to tax passenger vehicles in the future. Okay? So, yeah, thank you. I'd love to hear from someone from finance. Oh, oh boy. Well, I'm going to start this off by saying I like Representative Pettit. I like Senator Bizarro. I do. I truly like them. Senator Martin uh, died. Uh, I have no problem with Senator Martin either. It's just he hasn't spoken yet. But the two of them are absolutely wrong on this issue. There's no other way of saying it. Um, so, Representative Pettit mentioned that why don't we wait a couple of years to see if we actually have a, a shortfall in transportation funding. That's like having a boat leaking and sinking and saying, let's wait another day and see if we actually go underwater. When you know the water's coming in already. It, it's not, I don't mean to make light of it, but we know we have a shortfall in transportation funding. It's, we're not guessing how much funding we need every year. I believe it's around $2 billion a year in transportation funding, we need a little bit less, at $1.9 billion a year, we need in transportation funding every year to fill potholes and make sure bridges don't fall down. And we have charts and graphs that show the revenue that comes into the transportation fund <coughs> is shrinking. And in two years, it's not enough. In fact, five years ago, it wasn't enough. This myth that the transportation fund has been raided is so unbelievably bizarre because the reality is we keep putting money from the general fund into the transportation fund to keep it solvent. That car tax thing we talked about in the bipartisan budget, we did that because the transportation fund wasn't going insolvent. That money would be better off used in the general fund and used for all these other things, social programs and things that we want to do. So we talked, uh, tolls became a byword and a hot button item. It's not tolls. We have a financing problem for transportation. We have a certain amount of money we need to raise every year, and I am more than willing to bipartisan work with my colleagues to come up with an idea to come up with that money every year. Tolls is one option, 
uh, if there's an option, everything's an option. As Representative Sanchez said, borrowing the money really isn't an option. I mean, that just puts us in a bigger hole. We need to come up with a revenue stream that covers the transportation <laughs> needs we have in this state. And in, when we don't, and our transportation grid grinds to a halt, and you, it's already bad now, Fairfield County is out of control, Hartford, you can't go east, east of the river after 3 o'clock and every day, it's out of control. Until we solve these problems, that will hurt and seriously damage our economy if we don't have roads and bridges that work. The business leaders of this state, the CEOs of the major corporations, have been come out in favor of tolls and other financing issues for transportation because they know our infrastructure holds the economy back and it makes it less attractive to be in Connecticut. So we got to solve this problem one way or the other. We cannot say it's not a problem. The one thing we all agree on is that there is a financing problem for our transportation. And we got to come up to, and hopefully together, we can work together to solve this problem. Okay, we have about 12 more minutes left for discussion, so I'd like to change these. Can we keep it brief so that we can cover about two other topics? That would be nice. Thanks. I will do my best to keep it brief. Thank you so much. But I have been in the thick of things since day one. Uh, I have been on the Transportation Committee for five years. I was a member, now I am a ranking member. Tolls has been on the agenda since I've been at a state legislator. I, I have to be <coughs> honest that when I first came to the Capitol, that I, um, I am on public record stating the fact that I would, uh, I was open to tolls, but with a caveat of we would need to eliminate the gasoline tax, and I say that, uh, you know, you've heard that uh, the, you know, we are, we are taxed to death. Absolutely. If you compare what we pay for the use of a car and the purchase of a car and the taxes, and we begin with the sales tax, and then if you want to add in the property tax that representative uh, that Bobby mentioned about, uh, it's a totally uh, the disparity between New Britain and Hartford and Bristol and a smaller community is large for uh, buying, if you buy a Toyota truck uh, versus uh, in one community and the taxes you pay there on an annual basis versus a smaller community, there's a large disparity. So that needs to be fixed. However, you start adding up the use of a car where you pay the gasoline tax of 25%, uh, 25 cents a gallon on top of a 17 cent per gallon that goes to the federal government and some of that money comes back to us. But then you start adding the petroleum gas uh, gross tax that the truckers pay. And you start comparing that to other states, and there's a disparity there. And you wonder why we, why we should not be tolling. Well, those state, states do not have the same taxes that we have, that we're paying for currently for the use of a car. And by the way, I don't know if you all knew, but if you go in to trade a car with the recent budget that was passed, you're going to have a trade-in now, of not a $30 fee, but that's been increased to a $100 fee for a trade-in. So, so regarding the diversion of funding, listen, the SDF, Special Transportation Fund, was started in 1983. That was the lockbox, everybody. But through the years, because of, of not being able to balance the general, there are two sides to the, uh, I'll say, the budget, right, sort of. So you got the general, uh, general fund, and you got the, uh, the STF, Special Transportation Fund. The general fund, some of those expenditures, because they couldn't balance the budget, they tra shifted over into the Special Transportation Fund, and we had enough money into there because of the uh, gasoline tax was taking care of all that, and the intent was to repair our roads, our bridges, and our railways with those funds, but through the years, additional expenditures were transferred from the general fund side to the STF side, and thus creating this, this lack of funds in the STF. And there are diversions, about a billion dollars through since 1983, that has been diverted and, and not used for the purpose of, of repairing our roads, our bridges, and our railways. So, are we against tolls? Absolutely. Is there a plan out there that would address the tolls or not having tolls? Absolutely. Call faster. And I think if you took the time, you wanted to see and compare the two plans that are on the table right now, I please do. It's call faster. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any more questions? 
You, you don't want any more end tolls, huh? No. Well, okay. I, well, I was going to make a quick, quick comment on it. And just say, I mean, Very quick. Th just, I mean, bipartisan in my criticism on that. I, you know, I, I had the opportunity to serve at, on the Transportation Committee for eight years and chair it for four years. Probably read more studies, probably as many studies as you have on tolls. And, <laughs> and, but um, I think Governor Lamont has been misguided in focusing his efforts on financing transportation on tolls. And I think the Republicans have been wholly irresponsible in responding and sort of weaponizing the toll issue and avoiding the fundamental issue, which Representative Lopes mentioned, is that there is a financing, this is a financing issue. Every one of you know you need $2 billion, $2.5 billion a year to maintain and expand our, our system. Twelve years ago, there was a study done that said if we don't do something in transportation, Connecticut is becoming an economic cul-de-sac. And that's what's happening. And the longer you debate this, the more difficult getting back on track is going to be. I mean, this requires a bipartisan solution. It requires some revenue from somewhere. So, you know, you got to come up with a bipartisan solution. And that, that, that's just fundamentally important. It's, it's an environmental issue. It's a public safety issue. Uh, mass transit. Uh, all of that is tied into this. So, you know, this is a big issue. I just want to, on campaign finance reform, because you mentioned that $5 thing, there was no magic to that. There was, you know, actually what we had done at the time is we talked to campaign treasurers. And they said, if you're going to create a minimum contribution, give me a round number. <laughs> so that's what we did. The important part of that is, though, that you have a minimal number of contributions from within the district that demonstrate support. And that's, and that's the important part of that. So I really don't have a I was going to ask a question on tolls, but I think you just belabor that too much. Hello, I'm changing the subject. Um, my name is Adrienne Benjamin. I live in New Britain yes. uh, with my daughter who has severe disabilities and my husband. Uh, her name is Zoe. Some of you have met her um, up at the legislation, legislative office building. And I'm usually there to advocate for her needs. Today I'm here to advocate um, for, in general, the severe population of people with intellectual disability and autism. My question, I do have a question, but I have to give you background. Um, there's a proposal I've heard that might come out of the Labor Committee, which would eliminate the possibility of people with disabilities getting what's called a sub-minimum wage. Now what that means is someone who has a job, and I have, there's about 1,800 to 2,000 people in Connecticut that have these jobs, where they go in with a group, they have a job coach, they really can't do the job as well as Someone with disabilities. disabilities. Oops. Um, and what they do is they have to support the job coach, and they there's a, a fair labor practice that explains how you decide what their rate will be. So maybe they're paid four dollars an hour based on data that shows that they can do whatever percentage of the job. If we eliminate, so there's a federal program called 14C that allows this. I know this is complicated and probably not in everybody's wheelhouse. But there's about 1,800 to 2,000 people in the state who have these jobs, and these jobs mean everything to these kiddos. They're people with severe autism, severe intellectual disability. They would not be hired without going through an organization like this and a, and a program like this. And I was at a meeting last week with five other families who are terrified that their kids are going to lose their job. And I say kids, some of these people are 35, some of them are 45, and they're working in um, Michael's store with um, five people and a job coach, or they're working at St. Francis Hospital in the cafeteria. And I know that it's, it, I know there's good intention behind this proposal to eliminate some minimum wage, because obviously it sounds awful. Why would somebody make some minimum wage? So my question for you is, what do you think about the idea of, I'm hoping you do not agree with the idea of eliminating the sub-minimum wage program. And I'm interested in your opinions on that. Thank you. 
Yeah, I, thank you very much. I, I do have to leave, so I want to answer first. I want to thank the league and thank everybody again for being here. Um, Adrian, thank you for that question. And uh, one of the great things about these four is uh, these forums here is that you can um, learn a lot. We as legislators, I think, learn sometimes um, from some of the questions that are asked, and the audience learns as well. I mean, I, I was unaware of that. Um, what I would say is, uh, you know, hearing it for the first time today, um, it sounds like I would, uh, you know, I think we ought to make sure that we preserve that exemption. And that actually, um, that actually brings up something that, you know, I, I meant to mention earlier, and that is that if we're gonna live with the minimum wage bill as uh, it was passed, um, I think we ought to go back and take a look at some instances where we might make some exceptions, and that's a perfect example of it. Again, thank you for uh, to, for everybody being here this morning, and I apologize for having you. Who else would like to speak? I'll yeah, I would just say I, I I would not support changing that, and it, it shows you the unintended consequences of people that are well intentioned. Uh, not the the minimum wage when we had a meeting at CCRC. A year ago, with 15 to 20 nonprofits, all 20 nonprofits there said, "Please do not increase the minimum wage to 15 bucks an hour because we're going to have to decrease services. We're going to be able to take care of less clients. It's going to be a huge burden on our budgets, and we're not going to be able to to afford it." Speaker Speaker was there, but uh, you know, people people didn't hear that message from the nonprofits. Uh, I don't think you addressed your question. Um, yeah, so I, was, I, was, I, was, I said I wouldn't, I wouldn't support the change. Yeah, and I think the issue is this, and we've talked about this briefly, is um, you can't lump the disability community. There's people from very low functioning to very high functioning. And this bill, uh, the intent on this bill is to help probably the more high functioning people who are struggling with a disability, but it, it definitely could hurt people who are lower functioning. So when you... When you Anytime you try to lump a group, like a disability group, into one and make a bill that affects the whole group, there are definite unintended consequences. And we'll debate that bill all, all session. That'll, that'll be something worth looking into. Let's see if we can do something to help some, but not damage other people. Bobby, are we good? No. Okay, maybe we have one short comment, question, comments left. So, please. So, this is on, I'm Don Naples from New Britain. Um, I've never met Senator Martin, but. Uh, He's kind of the, the ideal person for this question, and I will get to it. Some of us are old enough to remember war bonds where uh, the citizens of the country helped fund World War II. Um, my wife and I have written letters to Senator Murphy and then uh, Representative Esty about uh, war bonds for infrastructure, an idea that my wife had for five years and nobody seems to listen, even though we get very encouraging comments back, even personal phone calls from uh, Representative Esty and who was on the Transportation Committee at the time, and um, Senator Murphy, but nothing ever happens at the federal level. So I'm hoping that maybe with the, uh, you and Representative Lopes being involved with transportation, we could come up with some kind of a program to do uh, infrastructure bonds that are like war bonds, where the citizens do it. Has several advantages. Um, first of all, you get the citizens involved, so uh, and it avoids the whole toll question. You do, it is borrowing, but you can do it and pay uh, less money uh, in, in the interest rate, and people will do it as their, their civic duty, and I think that's a great way to raise some money for uh, for infrastructure, and I hope the two of you could maybe make something happen. Thank you. Thanks, Don. As you as you know, you reached out to me on this, and I passed it forward. I think two years ago, and at the time, it, there's no definitive answer other than leadership. What at the time was not was not interested. Can you silence your phone, please? Um, was not interested in pursuing that. But like many things up there, we can ask and ask again and ask again. Um, we have a financing problem. We will listen to every idea. And uh, if it works, it works. We'd be happy to support it. Thank you. We, we, are, we always learn when we come to forums like this. And uh, we'll take your idea and present it. Uh, just to let you know, uh, both the 
uh, the governor's plan as well as the Republican FASTER, F-A-S-T-R, I believe, uh, plan, both includes a uh, federal funding, which is the, I believe it's called Build America, which allows us to borrow, uh, borrow funds at a lower interest rate. Currently, we any type of uh, special transportation or STO bonding is or tax uh, special tax obligation bonds STO from probably five six percent federal money. This Build America program is uh, some you can get as low as 08 percent up to three point four percent. So on an average, I believe both plans are about two point two percent. So it, it's sort of it is being looked at. We've never used it here in the state. And uh, for the first time, though, we are going to be, uh, it's in, it is in the, uh, the overall makeup of trying to solve this problem regarding our uh, transportation. Okay, I guess, thank you. I guess it's the last question. Should we wrap up? I think that considering we told people 11.30, unless one of you really wants to add two more cents into it, would you like to speak on it? Okay, well, we've covered a lot of the topics today. We've covered infrastructure repairs, tolls to pay for them, tolls to pay for other transportation issues, vaccines, vaping. The opioid problem got mentioned very briefly. Uh, after effects of incarceration and the Victim Advocates Office, the need for proper funding of that. The Citizens Election Program, that sounds like it is a well-supported program, and maybe we will see a change in the $5 requirement. We had questions about sexual offender noncompliance, and that was brought to people's attention. Contaminated brownfields, which certainly is an issue for New Britain. We have a lot of that property. We talked about minimum wage. We talked about minimum wage in a lot of different ways, including the needs of those who are mentally disabled. We talked about tolls, car taxes, and we talked about transportation bonds as a concept to be brought up to the legislature. I very much appreciate everybody's talk. I think we would all love to talk for a lot longer, but there are also those who need to get going, and I had said 11.30. So we will probably cut here. I'd like to mention that there's literature on the back table about the ECS formulas and about uh, how the ECS formula works. What's the ECS formula? Uh -huh. It is that which funds the public schools. It is state funding in support of public school education. So if you're interested in some data on that and some real fine print to work your eyes on, there's information <laughs> back there. League of Women Voters appreciates your coming. This is what we love doing most, sharing information out to people, hearing from people, being a conduit between government and us. And we hope that you'll come and support League at other functions and that you will have a very good day supporting your government, your people, your state. Thank you.